Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Sandy Hagar, who will uh, be presenting on the topic, What Happened to the Bond-Holding Class? A very important question, the political economy of U.S. public debt ownership. Sandy? All right, thanks, Tim. Um, I'm just going to get started right away because I've got a lot to get through. Uh, today I'm going to present for you uh, some of the research that I've done for my PhD project on ownership of public debt in the U.S. Now, for those of you who weren't at the first two installments of this annual conference series, what I did is I presented um, data and research um, on the ownership of public debt for the U.S. corporate sector. And what I showed in that um, research is that corporate holdings have become very heavily concentrated over the past three decades. And this, combined with um, decreasing taxation on large corporations, led me to conclude that the public debt has come to serve as a, a key mode of redistribution towards what Nitzan and Bickler refer to as, as dominant capital. So today, I'm actually going to present some, some new research um, that also is, is about public debt ownership. Um, but this time, I'm going to be focusing on the US household sector. And what I'm going to be presenting is at least as far as I'm aware, the first um, long-term historical analysis that, that maps ownership of the U.S. public debt by the wealthiest 1% of U.S. households over this past century. So I'm not only going to look at the distribution of ownership, but also at the potential redistributive effects that are associated with that pattern of ownership. And so in order to do this, I'm going to analyze the ownership structure of public debt alongside the pattern of federal taxation uh, to determine if interest payments on government bonds somehow redistribute income towards the, the top 1% of U.S. households. So just to give a little bit of a bit more background on my Ph.D. project, I start with, I guess, two very simple questions. And the first question is, who are the public creditors? And the second question is, is the um, distribution of government, government bonds highly concentrated? in the hands of a, a specific class or a specific social group. And from that analytical starting point, I then go on to consider these possible linkages between ownership and redistribution. In order to think about those linkages, I think it's useful to do it in the following way. So if the ownership of the public debt is highly concentrated, then that means that a certain class or, or a certain social group receives the bulk of interest payments on, on government bonds. And if that group that receives the bulk of interest payments on government bonds at the same time um, is different from the group that pays the taxes that service those debt interest payments, then that means that the public debt does serve as a mode of redistribution from taxpayers to, to public creditors. I don't have time to get into the historical background of this topic, but um, suffice it to say that the questions that I'm addressing and these issues really um, have a very long lineage. And in fact, political economists have grappled with these questions since the very birth of their science in the 18th century. But it wasn't really until the late 19th century that the first comprehensive theoretical and empirical studies of, of public debt ownership started to surface. And I guess a relatively obscure American political economist, at least nowadays, by the name of Henry Carter Adams, he produced uh, a pioneering study that uncovered what Adams himself referred to as the spectacle of a highly centralized public debt in the United States. Now, in this study, Adams actually offered empirical evidence suggesting that ownership of the U.S. public debt was heavily concentrated in the hands of what he referred to as a bond-holding class, and that's where I get that in, in my title. In Adams' um, view, this bond-holding class lent to and therefore um, controlled the government much like dominant shareholders control a corporation. And according to Adams, the interests of this bond-holding class conflicted with the interests of the wider population whose burdensome taxation went towards servicing the interest payments on, on government bonds. And so what makes Adams' study stand out, as far as I'm concerned, is that not only that did it offer really the first um, serious empirical evidence about the ownership of public debt, but Adams was really also keen or sort of aware to um, situate his analysis within a fairly sophisticated theoretical framework, one that drew on classical political economy and, and also a bit on Marx. So if we go from the late 19th century and, and fast forward to the present, we can see that there's been plenty of debate and discussion about public debt ownership since 
Adams produced this pioneering study over a century ago. But over that century of debate and discussion, what I argue is that we really have no clearer picture or consensus about even the most basic facts concerning public debt ownership in the US. And so we have no consensus on the underlying consequences of that pattern either. And so when it comes to the issue of ownership concentration of government bonds, some claim that things have, have changed quite drastically since Adams produced this study. Um, and in contrast to Adams, they argue that the public debt has become very widely held um, and very diffuse, and that the interest on federal government bonds actually redistributed income progressively from wealthy taxpayers to lower and middle class bondholders. And here, contemporary orthodox Keynesian economists have been the most adamant, I think, about downplaying uh, the concentration of public debt ownership. Um, and one of these economists is Francis Kavanaugh, who is also a former treasury official in the US. And in the mid-1990s, Kavanaugh argued that this vision of a powerful bondholding class is, is really just a relic of the 19th century. And according to uh, Kavanaugh, the main investor in US Treasury securities is, quote, John Q. Public, not John D. Rockefeller. And therefore, Kavanaugh makes this argument that interest payments on the public debt don't redistribute income from the poor to rich, that it's actually a progressive redistribution. And furthermore, Kavanaugh goes on to suggest, sort of hedging his bets, that um, the federal debt that's held by government trust fund accounts, these intragovernmental holdings of public debt in, in, the, in the trust fund accounts, such as Social Security and Medicare, that these ultimately benefit the middle and lower classes. And as these debt claims held in government trust fund accounts get liquidated into government transfer payments, then that really mitigates any lingering inequalities that may exist in the private ownership of the public debt. So really for Orthodox Keynesians, the conclusion is that the public debt serves the interests of ordinary Americans, or what Kavanaugh refers to as, as John Q. Public. But there's still others who, who emphasize continuity since Adams um, produced his study. And they claim exactly the opposite of, of Kavanaugh and the Orthodox Keynesians. So we still find references in some of the literature that suggest that um, public debt is highly concentrated into the hands of a wealthy elite, that interest payments on government bonds still redistribute income regressively, and they still uh, continue to make reference to a powerful bondholding class, even if they don't tend to, to cite Adams. So what's the problem here? Why, why do we have such a polarized debate? And why do political economists sort of fail to come to any consensus on even the most basic facts concerning public debt ownership and redistribution? The main problem as I see it is that even though there's been plenty of debate and there's a lot of political rhetoric surrounding this issue, there's really been um, only fragments of empirical evidence offered to, to support the respective views. So there's only been a handful of studies that even have even attempted to measure the pattern of public debt ownership in the US. So if you turn to page three of your handout, you'll find table one, um, which is here. Uh, and this, what I do in this table is just outline basically the, the existing evidence that we have about ownership of the public debt in the US. And all of these studies make reference in some way to, to the US household sector. Uh, and one of the most extensive empirical studies that we have is really that of Adams, um, who based his analysis on census data from a single year, I think it was, I guess it was 1880. And over the past century since then, there's really been no improvement on Adams' research techniques. As you can see, there's only been four studies produced since Adams' pioneering efforts. And all of these studies offer narrow snapshots of the um, ownership pattern for single years. And there's been no attempt to, to develop long-term historical time series that map ownership changes in ownership concentration over time. All of these uh, studies use different methods and they use different cutoff points to measure concentration. And so this makes it really um, difficult to adjudicate between their competing claims. And it also makes it diff impossible actually to um, compare their research results over time. And as you can see in table one, to make matters worse, there's been no serious study of household ownership of the public debt since the early 1990s. So in short, we really don't know what's happened to this bondholding class since um, that, that Adams theorized and empirically mapped over a century ago. 
Um, and in addition to these empirical problems, I think there's also severe theoretical difficulties with the existing literature because none of them really offer much in the way of um, theoretical res um, reflection on the subject matter. And I don't use the word empiricist very lightly, but I think that describes for the most part um, the, the existing literature. And Adams in 1887 was really the, the pinnacle of theorization on this, on this topic with his eclectic framework. And, and subsequent studies really, they don't try to offer any theor theoretical explanation for why we should care about these issues of ownership and redistribution in the first place. And I think if you pushed any of these people, um, even the most um, mainstream of analysts would concede that these issues of, of distribution and redistribution are really classically issues of power because they involve asking who gets what and also who gets what at, at whose expense. But it's precisely on this issue of power, I argue, that conventional frameworks um, run into trouble. So by this point in the conference, we've all heard it many times, but what I suggest in the paper based on this research is that neoclassical economics, and that includes orthodox Keynesianism, they really have a tough time accounting for the power relations of debt and credit because they operate within the powerless realm of, of perfect competition and, and equilibrium. Now for Marx, he really put power at the center of his analysis of public debt in that famous last section in volume one of Capital, but Marx only really um, considered these dynamics within the pre-capitalist context of, of primitive accumulation. So in advanced capitalism for Marx and, and for most Marxists, the ownership of financial assets, including the public debt, um, gets demoted to the status of, of fictitious capital and the ownership of, of the means of production takes over as, as the key engine of class struggle. But, you know, he doesn't really analyze it in any great detail, especially in volumes two and three. And so because of these empirical and theoretical difficulties, I think we have a relatively clean slate to, to research and re rethink public debt ownership in the US. And just very briefly, I want to outline the contours of my own approach, which are anchored within this notion of capitalist power. Um, and I d I've, for the purposes here, I think there's just three key features that are relevant to my discussion. So first of all, following from Nitzan and Bickler, I argue that private ownership is really the central power institution of, of capitalist society, if not the only one. And that power conferred by ownership extends beyond machines to anything that can be owned and priced. Secondly, that power is, is a dynamic process. So in order to gauge changes in power, we need to analyze ownership as it, as it changes over time. And thirdly, um, power is a relative or differential process. So we need to look at the ownership share of a group of dominant capitalists to gauge their power. So these theoretical propositions, I think, lead to um, alternative empirical methods and alternative accounting techniques. So given the fact that power is dynamic, where possible we should try to extend beyond narrow snapshots and look at historical time series. And, and given that power is relative, we need to focus on the differential share of, of dominant capitalists. And in my study, I've used the top 1% of households as a proxy for dominant capital. And as we've heard, this, this cutoff point for the ruling class or for dominant capital is always arbitrary. And the reason that I've uh, chosen to focus on on the top 1% is because it's become the focal point of, of current debates. So, and these debates, as we've seen, have extended beyond the Occupy Wall Street movement. And now we have even mainstream economists like Joseph Stieglitz talking about the top 1%. And just as an, as an aside, um, in a recent interview with Tim in the Review of Capitalist Power, Nitzan and Bickler argue that focusing on the top 1%, it doesn't necessarily tell us everything about ruling class power or about dominant capital, but here, in, in sort of following a quotation from them in that interview, I'm using it as an indirect proxy for capitalist power. So with that um, background information in place, I want to move on to what I think is the more interesting bit, and that's the research that I've done on, on the ownership of public debt by the top 1%. And if you turn to page four, you'll find figure one. Um, Figure one outlines or highlights my somewhat painful efforts to construct a reliable time series of, of the ownership share of the top 1% for the public debt. 
And this is based on a number of sources, and it's also based on my own analysis of, of micro data from the Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finances. So what you'll see here is a, a distinct V shape, I guess it would be. I think if I had more data available, it would be a U-shaped pattern. And just as an aside, the little circles, they represent the days that I, or the dates that I actually have data available for. Um, so we can assume that it's, it's a U-shaped pattern. And in the early 20th century, we see that the top 1%'s ownership share hovered at around 40%, that this fell drastically in the post-war period and then began to augment rapidly again in the early 1980s up until the present. Now, in the context of the current crisis, um, the ownership share of the top 1% breached the 40% mark uh, for the first time since 1922, when reliable data first became a da available. <laughs> so just even starting with this basic graph, we're already starting to see cracks in the argument that the public debt is somehow widely held um, in America. And if you turn to page five, uh, to figure two, what I've done in this figure is just taken that series from figure one on the ownership of public debt and compared it to two different measures of the top 1% share of wealth in general in the US. Um, and what we see here are, I guess, strikingly similar patterns. Much has been made about the U-shaped pattern of wealth and income inequality in the U.S. recently when we look at it over the past century. And in the terminology of Edward Wolf, who's one of the main um, researchers on wealth inequality, Wolf has argued that wealth distribution in the U.S. has become, in his words, very top-heavy since the early 1980s. And if we look at figure two, if that is indeed the case, then ownership of the public debt has also become very top-heavy. And in fact, in the context of the current crisis, concentration in the ownership of public debt has increased much more rapidly than the concentration of wealth in general. So based on these preliminary results, I think it's quite misleading to claim that the public debt somehow serves the interests of John Q. Public, to use Kavanaugh's words. Um, so what's at stake here? In some ways, it's, it's enough to sort of establish these basic facts to, res to refute some misleading and widespread claims about the ownership of public debt. But in my analysis, I want to go on to consider, consider some of the consequences um, of this growing concentration in public debt ownership over the past three decades. And perhaps one of the most obvious consequences and the one that's um, certainly focused on in the existing literature is the potential redistributive effects that are associated with this growing inequity in public debt ownership. So just to clarify, in the context of the analysis here, if the relative share that the top 1% receives in interest payments on the public debt, if, those, if that share increases, well, the relative share that the um, top 1% pays in federal taxation decreases, then we can say that, at least indirectly, the public debt serves as a mode of redistribution from the bottom 99% to the top 1% of households. Now to get into some of the technical details, there's actually no way to determine precisely who pays the taxes that finance interest payments on the public debt. So there's no conventions within government budget accounting that earmark uh, certain taxes for government debt servicing. But we can, as I said, sort of explore the redistributive effects of public indebtedness in broad terms and indirect terms by looking at the relationship between the relative share that the top 1% uh, pays in federal taxation and comparing that to the relative share that it receives in interest payments on the public debt. Um, and again, this will be an indirect measure because we can't really know precisely whose taxes pays whose interest payments. But this indirect measure of redistribution, I think, is still useful, especially when we consider that um, interest payments represent a very um, significant component of government expenditures. So according to the Office of Management and Budget, since 1980, the net interest that's paid by the federal government um, on average is accounted for about 14% of current expenditures. And that represents about two-thirds of the amount that's, that's dedicated to military spending. And over that same time period, the amount that the federal government pays in net interest has on average equaled about 27% of federal tax receipts. Um, so interest payments represent about one third of federal taxation, so that makes them quite significant. 
So if you turn to page six, you'll find figure three, and there's two series in figure three, and what this series, try, this figure tries to do is really offer this indirect measure of the redistributive effects of public indebtedness. So the thick line um, plots the differential interest or the share of interest payments on the public debt that are received by the top 1% of households. And the thin line, it plots the um, differential effective taxation or the ratio of effective taxation that's paid by the top 1% relative to the effective tax rate for the average population as a whole. And effective taxation is just the um, total taxes paid divided by total taxable income. So what does um, figure three tell us? As we can see from 1970 to the mid-1980s, there's been a massive increase in the differential interest payments received by the top 1% from around 19 to 35%. Uh, and since the mid-1980s, this share has had held um, fairly steady at about 30%, though it's declined slightly recently. And at the same time, we see that the um, share of federal taxation paid by the top 1% has really steadily decreased. And this fall is especially dramatic, as you can see in the 2000s, and that's the result of the Bush-era tax cuts that were recently renewed by Obama. So just taking this, um, on page seven, you'll find figure four. And what figure four does is just offers a, a sharper visualization of these dynamics of redistribution that I plotted um, in figure three. And so what that redistribution index in figure four does is it combines the two series from figure three. And so what I've done is I've expressed the two series as a ratio and rebased it to to 100, and I've placed the differential interest payment series as the numerator and the differential effective taxation series as the denominator. So just to clarify, a decline in that index would, would indicate progressive redistribution. So over time, that would mean that the top 1% would be giving up more in taxation than it receives in interest payments. If the line was horizontal, then that would indicate stasis. So over time, the top 1% would be receiving approximately what it gives out. And an upward sloping line indicates regressive redistribution. So over time, the top 1% would be giving up less in taxation than it receives in, in interest payments on government bonds. And the picture here is fairly clear. So what we see in, in figure four is that since the mid-1960s, there have been two significant waves of regressive redistribution. And one of those waves was from the mid-1960s to the late 1980s. And then there was a stasis and even a bit of a decline throughout the 1990s. And that's followed by another sharp um, upward turn in, in regress of redistribution since 2000. So as we start to dig deeper, we really start to see more problems with this view that the public debt, not only that the public debt's widely held, but also that it redistributes uh, income progressively. But um, there's still one argument that ardent naysayers could potentially invoke to downplay uh, the research that I've, that I've done here. So if you recall from my earlier discussion, uh, I mentioned that Orthodox Keynesians such as Francis Kavanaugh, that they've suggested that the public debt that's held by intergovernmental trust fund accounts, that this, these holdings really represent the interests of middle and lower class Americans. And, the amount of debt that's held by the U.S. federal government itself is very significant. Since 1980, it's, it's represented about half the size of the public debt that's held by the public. And in 2011, it, it was about $4.6 trillion outstanding. So it is a significant number. But how then, and this is the question I've had to ask myself in my research, how do we go about exploring this claim that, that the public debt that's held in government trust fund accounts, that these serve middle class and lower class interests? The outstanding level of intergovernmental debt doesn't really tell us anything about winners and losers in the disaggregate. But when the government um, pays out social security benefits or Medicare, then technically what it does is it cashes in some of its treasury securities from that government trust fund accounts, and it pays it out to Americans in um, dollars and cents in the form of transfer payments. So what we can do is really determine the extent to which government transfer payments um, offset the redistributive burden borne by the 99% of households, bottom 99%. And 
indeed, if um, the bulk of government transfer payments do flow to the bottom 99% of households, then the, re the regressive redistribution that I outlined earlier would be potentially offset. But the problem with that argument is that uh, the facts just don't, don't support it. Um, a recent study by the Congressional Budget Office has indicated that the relative share of government transfer payments received by the upper strata of U.S. households, that it's actually increased over the past three decades. And unfortunately, the CBO's data, <laughs> the study's um, very interesting, but um, the data itself is based, or the data are based on um, quintiles of the population. So they don't tell us anything exactly about the percentage of government transfer payments that are received by the top 1%. But I think this measurement of transfer payments and their distribution um, still paints a pretty telling picture. So on page eight of the handout, you'll find figure five, and that just um, plots the Congressional Budget Office's findings. So as we see here, the, the relative share of government transfer payments that are received by the top 20% of American households, it's increased quite modestly from 9% in 1979 to around 12% in 2007. And at the same time, the amount of government transfer payments received by the bottom quintile has decreased very drastically from about 54% to 38% over the same period. So using this indirect measure, we can see that over time, government transfer payments have, have been playing a decreasing role in offsetting the redistributive burden borne by lower and um, middle class Americans. So just by, uh, I guess, a way of conclusion, the, the presentation that I've done here has had many twists and turns. Um, but in many ways, these twists and turns are, are important because of the constant attempts within the mainstream or within Orthodox Keynesian to downplay um, concentration and ownership of public debt and these redistributive effects. So for those who want to downplay this issue, the first step is just to deny that the distribution of public debt is, is concentrated. And when that fails, the second step is to argue that the regressive structure of public debt is somehow offset by a progressive tax structure. And when that fails, um, the third step is to, complain, is to claim that the redistributive burdens of, of public debt and taxation are somehow offset by um, the debt held in intergovernmental accounts. And once that debt gets liquidated, it turns into transfer payments and everyone turns out happy and satisfied. Um, but the data presented here, I guess, brings into question all three of these claims. And so just to end on that note, I think based on the research that I've presented here, it's time to stop assuming that the public debt somehow serves the interests uh, of John Q. Public. And over the past three decades, um, especially, it's, I think, quite clear that the public debt is, is a power institution dominated by uh, dominant corporations and now, based on these results, also the top 1%. So thank you. On behalf of all of us, uh, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Uh, we have questions already. Uh, thank you very much, Sandy. Uh, always excellent. Let me ask you a technical question. Um, uh, one of cl clarification uh, before any further conclusions can be drawn. On figure three in the note, you state that um, you actually impute the amount of interest by multiplying the top 1% share of saving bonds and other federal bonds by the corresponding year-end interest rate. Mm -hmm. So I, I would assume that if you are imputing the amount of interest, you would, as the most basic assumption, assume that everybody who owns uh, a $1 worth of bonds will be receiving the same rate of interest. Yeah. So if you have the distribution of the bonds, you don't need to actually use the rate of interest because it cancels between the numerator and the denominator. Mm. Uh, um, let, let me finish the yep. question uh, uh, and then you clarify what you have done. Because if, if I'm correct in terms of, since this is an imputation, so you're simply looking at the ratio of the holding of the top 1% relative to the total relative to the rest. Mm -hmm. And that should be the same as the path of the uh, 
the dotted line on figure two, hmm. starting from about, uh, you start from around 65 or so. Hmm. Now, in the beginning, it seems to be similar, but then uh, from 1990 or so, the dotted line starts to rise on figure two, but the hmm. thick line on uh, figure three kind of moves sideways, and that might be because you are multiplying by the uh, declining rate of interest. So maybe I'm completely misreading it, but if I'm not, uh, and you will not impute the rate of interest, the thick line will continue to rise. rise. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll try to clarify. I'm just going to take okay. them one at a time. Okay. Um, so what happens with the survey of consumer finances? In terms of ownership, it breaks down ownership of savings bonds and um, other government bonds, federal bonds. And so what I've done is taken those different shares and multiplied them, because the Treasury actually um, publishes year-end reports about the um, interest on savings bonds and also for the interest on other federal bonds. And so that is probably accounts for why these don't look exactly the same because it must be because of a declining interest rate on the type of bonds that the top 1% are holding, if that makes sense. So the distribution, what you're saying is that this decline relative <laughs> to the previous chart would occur if the distribution of bonds between different uh, agents, if you like, in the political economy will be not uniform. So people at the top would hold different types of bonds and therefore receive different interest rates. Yeah, I haven't looked at it very closely, but for example, if you look at the distribution of ownership, it's usually lower in middle class households that hold savings bonds, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then other federal bonds are completely dominated by the top 1%. Oh, I see. Okay. And so if you multiply, I think savings bonds, I can't remember exactly, but the interest rate has been fairly steady, at least okay. since the 1990s. And you do have quite large fluctuations in the interest rate on other I federal see. bonds. Okay, so mm -hmm. thank you for the uh, clarification. Mm -hmm. Troy? Uh, I'm wondering about the differential interest within dominant capital that we might understand through this analysis, because with the government famously dropping interest rates to historical lows for extending for such a long period of time, it would seem to work against the bond holding class and famously in favor of, of the, you know, those hold with interest in banks. Um, so do you think that this differential interest is there or are we really talking about one in the same groups? Could you, uh, the differential, you mean literally differential interest? So if you're interest? thinking about, if you're separating out the <laughs> bond holders from those with an interest in, in the banks, mm -hmm. the bond holders are being hurt by these low interest rates. There's, there's a differential redistribution mm -hmm. from the bond holding class to those holding the banks to protect their interests. So is this bond holding class a, a separate identifiable unit within the dominant ownership class? Mm -hmm. Or does the dominant ownership class share equally in both bond holding and equity, I guess? Yeah. My suspicion is I haven't looked at it that closely, but I mean, you could say that they've lost out through the crisis, but there's also been what's called a flight to safety, right? And so obviously the top 1% of households has voluntarily come to invest massive sums in, in, in the public debt. Um, I don't think there is any sort of division between the household version of the bondholding class and the, and the large corporate bondholding class. I imagine that their interests are aligned, but um, I guess it's open, open to question. One thing that I do talk about in the paper that this, base, this is based on is if we look at the U shape and we look at it currently, there's been a massive redistribution of ownership in the public debt, and I think a lot of the volatility or conflict that could arise from that has been um, subdued by exactly what you mentioned, which is the low interest rates. I think if interest rates start to spike in the U.S., what we're going to have happen is a massive redistribution of income towards the top 1% because higher interest rates mean more, more income on, on government bonds, but that's just a hypothesis. Just a quick follow-up on that. What is not shown by your measures is the capital gains mm. that is derived by a declining interest rate. So as interest rates decline, the market value of those bonds rises. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's difficult to measure. People have tried to estimate it, but the market value of the public debt, I could look at doing it, but it's, it's not, not an easy thing to do as far as I can see. But. Okay. 
Um, just t two thoughts, um, small ones. Uh, one is, um, what about a uh, municipal bond market, which is about two-fifths the size of the U.S. Treasury, of the publicly held U.S. Treasury debt market? Um, we would expect it would show the same trends, but you probably will want to look at that because it's the same it's going to be the same set of people and it's going to have the same dynamics. Mm -hmm. And it's a claim on public purses and in a yeah. federal system in which um, municipal bonds are not just cities, it's state. All every, it's everything but federal for those yeah. of you who don't know America, the U.S. part of America. Um, uh, but uh, because those entities uh, raise a lot of revenue also, um, it will be just as redistributive potentially. Um, and the second thing is the tax consequences of a holding federal debt are interesting. Federal debt is free from state taxation, state income taxation. And the nice places to live are all high tax states, high income tax states, California, New York. Um, so it, this actually would magnify the redistributive effects because um, there's a tax concession on the interest that you earn from federal debt. Okay, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll just follow up with the, with the second comment. It's interesting because um, Adams in 1887, he actually looked at the geographical distribution of, of the public debt and he found exactly that, uh, not Car California, but with the eastern states, that it was heavily concentrated there. So, but. Oh, thanks, Andy. That was uh, quite an excellent presentation. I'm just wondering if any of this data includes uh, foreign investors in the U.S. debt or is this just from inside the United States, top 1%, who are, who are the top 1%? And what did you, where do you find the, the top quintile uh, demographically? Where, where is this all from? Because for example, you know, China owns $2 trillion in, in US securities or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'll just take the time then to outline a bit more about the PhD project. So what I'm doing, I think, for the project is just looking at domestic owners and dividing it sectorally. So I have a chapter on the household sector, which will be based on this research. And I also have a chapter um, based on the corporate sector, which is based on the stuff that I presented at earlier conferences. And the foreign ownership issue, I may include it in, in this thesis if I have time. <laughs> uh, if not, it'll, it'll be- Don't do it, Sandy. It'll be the postdoc project. So, um, <laughs> but it, it's very important because foreign ownership is now, represents 50% of, of US public debt. And what I'm interested in is not necessarily tapping into the issue, does it represent American decline or, or hegemony, but um, how that could possibly be, derated, de be related to these dynamics that I'm ide identifying domestically, so. I don't have a question or comment, but just a plea. Okay. Will you please include the, the foreign owners? Oh boy, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try to. Mm. Mm -hmm. It will happen. If it doesn't happen in the PhD, it will happen yeah. at some point. So. As soon as possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Yeah. Sean and then uh, David. Yeah, awesome presentation, Sandy. Stunning charts. Um, just figure four, you, you mentioned that the uh, huge hike from 2000 is the Bush Obama tax cuts. I'm just wondering if you have a qualitative story for the uh, original hike in the beginning of 1970 or so. And also, from, from what I understand, um, individuals can't buy uh, U.S. government debt. So the U.S. treasuries are sold to a handful of banks, and then, and then uh, they sell it to wealth managers. So, I was just, so like BlackRock, State Street Capital Group, and so on. So I'm just wondering um, how you're getting your data on, on individual owners. Are you assuming that um, American, like, so the, the assets under management of BlackRock and so on are, are only of American citizens, or because clearly they're not, right? Like, so there are going to be some foreign owners involved, and so how did, how would that affect your data on on uh, income concentration, like yeah. in the top one percent in America? Uh, as far as I understand it, um, the U.S. has to auction its data to the, the institutions that you're talking about, but those institutions can then go on and sell it directly to households. So households can actually own own U.S. public debt and. Now they're actually finding ways to circumvent it. China is now has its own direct um, relationships, but also U.S. households. If you go onto the Treasury Direct website, you can buy bonds. I think it's not only savings bonds now either. You can buy whatever, you can buy bills, notes, anything that you want um, directly. 
and so it doesn't include institutional holdings, which show up in the IRS data, which is for the corporate sector. Um, as far as the spike, uh, as far as I know, there were major tax cuts in around 68 in the US, federal tax cuts, I think, around that time. I haven't looked at it. The reason I haven't really gone too much into the qualitative story is that I thought I would look at the quantitative pattern and ownership and, and, and write this story until I encountered these orthodox Keynesian arguments. So it's not enough to look at the ownership. You've got to look at taxation. You've got to look at government transfer payments. And so it ended up being, it ended up mapping maybe in the Luturian sense. And so for me, at least at this stage, I want to get into to looking at the archival stuff. But <laughs> trust me, the amount of stuff that I have already is, is substantial for the thesis. And that's only because I'm having to engage with these count counter arguments. But. Uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to know what you think about the efforts, you know, the insistence always on deficit reduction by the wealthy and the wealthy parties, and uh, how does that jibe with this? Are they just playing a game where it's like, we'll flip a coin, heads I win, tails you lose kind of thing? I mean, or do they really care, and why would they care if they're going to collect a lot of money from increased government debt? Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question. This is where I've tried to engage with a lot of post-Keynesian macroeconomic analysis because the um, I think you know I don't I'm not necessarily sure that all elements of the ruling class of dominant capital are for deficit re reduction and debt reduction. If you look, I think it was the Australian case recently where Australia actually tried to get rid of its debt. The banks were up in arms over that. They were adamant against it. Um, the same thing happened in the US in the late 1990s with um, the Clinton surpluses. Mm -hmm. A lot of banks were extremely unhappy with the fact that the US was, um, was you know, getting rid of its risk-free asset, that type of thing. And um, so I, I don't know. I think when push comes to shove, there's, there's actually a lot of, of, of resistance to it. But it, it is a very important question. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're out of time. Thank you for your conversation and discussion, and thanks, Sandy. Thank you.